Hi, my name is Allison Flynn, and I'd like to tell you about the research and development my group does to better equip students with knowledge and skills in chemistry. Our hope is that by empowering students with a deep understanding of chemistry's patterns and principles, they'll be better able to use that knowledge in later courses, in their everyday lives, and in their careers. So I'd like to start by asking you how you would arrange these images into categories. And when I've asked this question of groups in the past, there have been all sorts of different answers. As one example, people have said they could sort into liquids and solids. They could sort by different colors. Some would sort into foods and drinks that they could obtain locally versus those that would be transported from farther away. And all of these are absolutely possible ways, none more correct than the other. But sometimes there are certain things that we would need to know more deeply about the materials, say, for example, if we wanted to eat in a more healthy way. So this idea of sorting um, in terms of, by different kinds of patterns or different kinds of categories um, is, is an inherent trait in other areas as well. In music, for example, we could start to look at all the different notes on the surface, like we might look at all the colors of the different foods and drinks. But if we were trying to play a piece only by knowing the notes at the surface and we forgot one of those notes or a series of those notes, we could really be lost. But if we knew more deeply how the chord progressions worked, what key we were playing in, then even if we forgot a note or two, the whole piece could stay cohesively and sound great together as a whole. Similarly in sports, if we forgot a page of our 200 uh, page playbook, but at the same time we knew that our system worked in a way that we always had two different options for the ball carrier, then the, the play or the offense could still move forward, uh, maybe not quite as intended, but at least in a, still in a powerful way. So it turns out the same kind of thing happens in, in chemistry. Often in traditional curricula, students are learning by just the things that are on the surface. And they are then trying to learn pages and pages and pages out of textbooks in a seemingly unconnected way. And the result is that they end up memorizing tables, charts, rules, without a deeper understanding of fundamental reactivity, of patterns and principles that underlie and underpin um, the way that chemistry works, the way that reactivity works. But worse than just not doing well on an exam or only memorizing for the exam, doing well on it and then forgetting, is students taking courses in chemistry where they should be learning knowledge about molecules and how they work, and then not understanding how vaccines work to protect us. Or not understanding how dilution to a large degree results in a substance that may not even have the original molecules in it and may only have water or they may not be able to use their chemistry knowledge in local or global contexts for local and global issues, like for the sustainable development goals. So we tried to tackle that problem a few years ago, coming back to this idea of patterns. And instead of organizing the organic chemistry curriculum as a series of, of unrelated topics, um, looking at what molecules are on the surface, instead we organized the curriculum in a way that went deeper. We organized rather by the principles and patterns of the reactions that molecules undergo. How do they work? And as we did this, there were two main colleagues who really supported and, and uh, drove this work forward. The first was Keith Fagnew, who, when he was teaching first year organic chemistry, really wanted students to learn the core principles of reactivity. How do they attract? How do they collide? Before getting to more complex chemistry. Tony Durst, on his side, questioned regularly why we taught students a, on the surface, seemingly simple looking molecules, but underneath underwent very complex chemistry. Why teach these first, which is what we had been doing, what most curricula in organic chemistry across the world do. Why do this first? Why not again, come back to that idea of principles of reactivity. So a few years ago, we implemented a new curriculum thinking about those things. So a few years ago, we implemented a new curriculum at the University of Ottawa organizing by patterns and principles of reactivity. Now where my research group comes in is to investigate the effects of this curriculum. Is it having the intended effect or are students just resorting to surface level memorization and forgetting yet again once they finish that exam? 
So some of our results are, are really exciting. We've seen that students in both familiar kinds of questions and in predicting reactivity of unfamiliar questions, well, they're doing better in this new curriculum as compared to the old curriculum. We're also studying the ways in which they, they organize their thinking. Are they seeing things by patterns? And are those surface level patterns or deeper level patterns? My group investigates how the students interpret chemistry's language, how they visualize molecules. How, how, what does it look like at that molecular level? We investigate how students reason with evidence and what sophistication of scientific arguments they use and can be taught to use. And we look at how students connect their chemical knowledge to broader issues, such as the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. It's also really important to us that other educators be able to use the products of our research. And so we spend a lot of time as well on knowledge mobilization. So as examples, we've developed Org Chem 101. This is a series of modules to help students learn organic nomenclature, the symbolism of reaction mechanisms and principles of acid-base reactions. We've also developed uh, learning tools that are more broadly applicable in any discipline. So that includes a growth and goals module to support student learning, as well as remote teaching guides, uh, both for professors and for teaching assistants. So if you're interested in learning more, I'd invite you to take a look more at our research, and you can certainly find more information at flynnresearchgroup.com. Thanks for listening.